on October 20th at 6.03 p.m. We're at Bellows Free Academy, and this is the Maple Run Unified School District Board of Directors meeting. Nobody's leaving, so I guess everyone's supposed to be here. Um, we're going to do an agenda review. Um, I need to make one change to the agenda. We're going to move um, the presentation 7B, Alternative Program Proposal, <coughs> to after the consent agenda and before old business. Um, and perhaps in the future you'll see presentations more at the beginning of the agenda after consent agenda and before old business so that we can dismiss people after they give their presentation if they don't want, want or need to stick around. Um, having made that change, uh, need a motion to approve the amended agenda, please? Oh. Is there a sec uh, uh, so that was Alan, Joanna. All right, I need to take a poll for that motion. Jack? Yes. Al? Yeah. Nina? Yes. Susan? Yes. Joanna? Yes. Grant? Yes. <coughs> Alicia? Yes. Peter? Yes. Is Katie here yet? No, I don't see no, her. No, Katie. Um, and Nilda, yes. Okay, next item on the agenda is <coughs> the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. <coughs> the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Anna. Katie's up there right now. Katie, are you here? No, she's just in the waiting room. Oh. Okay. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> well, somebody let me know if she's here just so we can have the numbers. <clears throat> okay. Visitors. Um, as far as visitors in the room, do we have any visitors that wish to speak in the room? Doesn't look like it. Do we have any visitors remotely that wish to speak? If so, you do, <coughs> type your name in the, you have some, how many people do you have? Um, so right now I have one, Ryer Erickson would like to speak, and nobody else just yet. Okay. Um, Ryer, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Are you okay if I forego the reading of the visitor section and just state your name and the town of residence and we proceed? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're on. <clears throat> Ryer Erickson, St. Albans City. <clears throat> so I'm speaking today to try and both honor and question the work of equity in the district. In order to understand that work, I went directly to the Castle um, SEL equity curriculum, in which it states districts must engage hey. students, families, and communities as authentic partners in social and emotional development. The relationships between a district and school, staff, students, families, and communities are at, one, at the core of systemic SEL. In order for SEL to affirm the assets of children from diverse backgrounds, Schools need to understand the cultures, lived experiences, and values of families and communities, and all students need to feel ownership over their own social and emotional development. What it looks like, students, families, and community partners are active partners in the planning and implementation of SEL and play a role in district decision-making. All students have frequent opportunities to share their perspectives and feedback. So this is important because there is a lack of diversity of lens when it comes to the faculty, <clears throat> staff, administrators, and you as a board. And that lack of diversity directly affects the way this district tackles complex subjects like equity. The problem with the lack of diversity is instead of solving problems, people retreat inward and tell those with an issue that the problem is in fact with them. Now that leads to letter rhetoric that includes, if you don't like it, leave, and no one is forcing you to stay, and other NIMBY-esque attitudes which I hope most of us could agree is not a solution to anything. So where to go? Uh, apologies are a great start. So are performative actions, but those only go so far. And if they're not backed up with policy are often the cause of more disappointment. So waving signs in front of the school while a wonderful show of solidarity is kind of blank without substantive real policy change. So many people despairingly are suggesting where there is no cure for racism, there's no cure for bigotry, et cetera, but there really is, and it's called empowerment, and it's called giving people a seat at the table. So what I'm really asking for is for you to simply follow the curricula you've put in place through CASEL to engage in real dialogue with people who are underrepresented in our district 
and who have different life experiences than your own. Thank you. Thank you. One second to spare. <laughs> Anyone else wish to speak? We have uh, one other person, Anna Roberts. Anna Roberts. Hi, Anna. Um, I usually read our little prelude related to visitors. I don't know if you've been <clears throat> present before to hear it, so I'm going to read it now. Um, the public comment visitor section of the meeting is an opportunity for community members to address issues of concern about policy, budget, or administrative matters, or to share ideas about how, to, how we can work together to improve our schools. We value input and respect divergent views. We ask you, limit your, to, you to limit your remarks to the time constraints prescribed by me, which is two minutes, and refrain from airing grievances with individual members of the school community, including respecting the privacy of the students and the parents. Those wishing to speak, as I noted before, will need to state their name in their city and town of residence. Those attending remotely may put their name in the comment section during the meeting, and um, the comment sections will uh, be disabled. So, Anna. Yes. You may speak. Okay. Anna Roberts. I live in St. Albans Town. My daughter attends SATEC. She is in fourth grade. Um, I have been going through the whole quarantine process a couple of times now. And um, me, along with other parents, are very frustrated with the process that is in place. And I, I would really like to know, um, and I was told that these numbers were not public. Um, <clears throat> my daughter has had to quarantine twice because of close contact. And that being on the bus. Uh, on the bus. So I would like to know how many positive cases come out of that close contact after testing. You must have those numbers. I don't need any names. I would just like to know how many positive cases come out with those close contacts. And I believe that they're pretty much all negative. Um, and wondering if the school district can change their policy on this close contact nonsense because it's i mean our kids are missing out on school teachers are out um it just it's ridiculous what can be done about that it needs to change i've asked the health department their take on it they said it's up to you it, it you make the decisions on this so um and then i talked to the school nurse and she said no the health department makes the decision on it so who is it? I want to know. And I want to know those numbers. I don't think that's too much to ask. A lot of parents want to know this information. Thank you. Does that seem reasonable to you? Um, I think if you stick around for the superintendent's report, you may get some of the information you're looking for. Um, Great. Anyone else on the uh, docket to speak? Nope, no. that's it. Okay, so. That ends the visitor section. All right, moving on, we're on to consent agenda. Can I have a motion to either accept the consent agenda or, well, I don't need a motion. Does anyone <coughs> want to pull anything out of the consent agenda to discuss? Hearing none, we're going to move on uh, and accept the consent <coughs> agenda. Going on to the um, revised agenda, we're going to do what was 7B alternative program um, proposal and Alexis and her colleague whose name I don't know <laughs> you will soon. okay so I'm just gonna start off by introducing Elijah he's gonna actually kick off the presentation for the board um, so this is Elijah Church and he has been part of the committee work and actually very passionate about this work for, I would say about 18 12 to 18 months um, and has been a great resource and support and he is a special education case manager for the Novus program at BFA which you will see a little bit more about what Novus is if you don't know when we go through the presentation Greetings, everybody. Greetings, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. 
think this works. Okay, so can everybody hear me okay? All right, so I am kicking off our proposal for an alternative program for BFA. I was lucky enough to be part of a committee that had department heads and administration, members of guidance. Um, we had all the leaders from the special education programs present, and it was, it was a great committee to be part of. There was so much knowledge and so much passion up there, and all of these people are really supportive of this program. We have three alternative programs currently, and all of them require that people be on an IEP, that they be in special education. Um, I'll go through them real quick. There's the Learning Center, which is focused on specific learning disabilities, and that's probably the largest as far as numbers go. And then we have the Community Integration Program, which we tend to call SIP. And this is for kids that have intellectual disabilities. It is a highly alternative curriculum and it includes a community work experience component. They tend to go out and do work and they're, I think that's an amazing program too. And then there's Novus, which I am part of. We serve about 20 kids that have emotional and behavior disorders. And a good portion of them are with us all day but we try to support them as they go out into the general education curriculum as well. These are great, but they don't cover everybody that needs support by any stretch of the imagination. Novus is, like I said, only about 20 kids. Uh, I think there's a huge social, emotional need in our community. Um, not just because of COVID, but that has made it intensified. And the program that we're talking about having, instead of uh, requiring special education, it just requires that they have an educational support plan. All that means is that they've been referred by teachers to the MTSS um, system where we discuss how to respond, or how to intervene on their behalf. I'm a little bit nervous, so if I'm talking funny. Um, so we are hoping to help kids that are struggling to access their education in all sorts of ways. I'm not going to read all of that to you. And there are a lot of kids that are not on track to graduate. We have kids that go, they drop out, they go to uh, Vermont Adult Learning, which is a great program, but it's not for everybody. And I think that we could serve a lot of these kids here in our school as well. So the main difference is that we would not be limited to special education and we would provide a more flexible, fluid, dynamic, individualized program, which is not on site. All the other programs are on site and this we're hoping to have nearby, close enough that they can still interact with the general education programs, but off site so that we can um, I don't know, provide a uh, environment that caters to their individual needs. So I'm going to let Alexis talk. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the only piece that I would just add quickly about the committee is that, um, again, that's another committee that met um, all of last year and it went into the prior year. So we've been, this is again a process that has taken about 12 to 18 months. Um, and we have uh, support from Brett Blanchard, who is the principal of BFA. So even though Brett was not on the actual committee, that was intentional. Um, he was really empowering the work of the committee and was supporting um, this work behind the scenes. So again, it wasn't something that was done overnight. Um, it took a lot of conversations and a lot of meetings. And what we found is as soon as we thought we had a plan and a vision, we had to change it and we kept having to revamp and revise our vision and um, what we needed to put in place to better meet the needs of more students. So this is just a really uh, quick visual of all of the different components the committee met and tried to uh, tease apart and um, get more firm, solid ideas around for the board. The link in the middle, the BFA alternative program, that's actually a clickable link. 
So just to save time and not overwhelm the slides, if you click on that, it'll take you to a table that will show you all of this information. So it will show you what our vision and mission statement, what we're proposing that is. It'll show you the cap of the program that we're suggesting in terms of size. Um, so all of that information is in there. The different color codes are also intentional. So the light yellow for the physical space is because we have one um, that identified that would be perfect and ideal, but obviously we have not committed to anything. Um, the schedule and the program name are things that we want um, the staff to do. So if we move forward with, with this and we're able to make it happen, the staff who are actually working in the program along with the students would be the ones identifying the name and the schedule. And then what the committee can still do moving forward if we get the green light is to create a data-driven uh, um, referral process as well as a discharge process. So that's the missing link right now that the committee is willing to come back together um, and wrap up and finalize their work. So now we're gonna get into a lot of slides about budget and about um, cost and financial numbers. So um, my, Martha, our fearless leader, will hopefully chime in and help me if I misspeak or miss anything. So what this first slide shows is the cost in year one. So again, what we're proposing for staff in year one is a program manager, two general education teachers that would be dual licensed and a um, full-time school social worker. So those are all professional staff. Um, we have done some site visits and some um, meetings with landlords and on vacant buildings in the St. Albans community. Um, and the average, that's just a average of the, what the lease and what the utility cost would be if we get the space that we're recommending and we feel would be ideal. There obviously would be a cost for furniture and materials because we'd be moving into a vacant space and then there would be likely some facility startup cost. The total in the blue is, um, again, because we've done multiple site visits um, in a couple different spaces. The space we want is willing to really work with BFA and um, wants to make this work. So the rent and the lease other places would be double. Um, and would be higher. So that's primarily the cost difference. If we were further away from BFA, we would also likely need vans for transportation um, to get kids to and from the alternative space to BFA, and we would need drivers for those vans, which would likely require paras um, and ESPs to give that level of support. So that's all an additional cost if we have to deviate from the space plan that we're hoping to get. This just shows what the difference would be in years two and beyond. So again, the, the salaries and the benefits would go up of the staffing, but you wouldn't have the facility cost um, and you wouldn't have the furniture and materials because that would already be set and in place. Um, so again, it's a very similar projection. It just shows that there would be a cost reduction in starting with year two. So then what we did is um, we looked at our previous three year averages in terms of what we're spending as a district on um, both school-based behavior contracts. So that might be contracting with an outside agency to um, work one-on-one -on -one with students, write behavior plans for students, um, do behavior consultation with identified students. Um, as well as the students that we're currently supporting out of district and alternative placement. So some examples of that would be SOAR Learning Center, uh, Laraway and Johnson. So we looked at our previous three year average and a lot of the out of district alternative placements have a transportation component as well um, that we're having to pay for as part of that service and support. So um, you can see that we're spending a lot of money with trying to support kids um, with accessing their education out of their community. Um, so that's what that shows. This is just some non-monetary data that I think is really important to show the board and just be transparent. Um, so again, what the committee did is we looked at the number of students over the last three years that have um, 
Okay. Uh, three or more credits denied, um, the number of students we've lost to either unenrollment and dropout or they've left to go to Vermont Adult Learning, um, and that we have, uh, we're losing to attendance um, and chronic truancy concerns. And you can see some of those numbers are, are pretty high and pretty significant. Because um, again, all of this is just looking at grades nine through 12. So we're not looking at all of Maple Run, we're just looking at the high school. This one? Yep. So this, these are students that we feel we're losing due to chronic truancy and, and disengagement because they have more than 20 absences. So, Yes, of high school students. So that's um, 172, that would include the 35 and the 12 above it? Um, not necessarily, because some students go to Vermont Adult Learning before, and it's not an attendance concern. They just choose to take that alternative pathway for graduation. So it's not an addition, it's a separate category. So we looked at the attendance data and we counted up the total number of students that had 20 or more absences. They may or may not be included in the other two numbers above. So you're just showing us numbers of issues. It, this isn't necessarily the targeted group that would go to the alternative learning <coughs> program? It, it could be, yeah. No, 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 no. This is just showing you the population of students that we could serve. Yeah. I can't use this anymore. Okay. That was last school year, yes. And again, the attendance was a little different last year because of COVID, so it was reflected a little differently, but yes. These are not medical absences, these are non-medical absences. So yeah, these are excused and unexcused. Yes. So what, what we also did is we went through and we kind of did a three-year projection, which is really um, a guesstimation. So um, what we did was we looked at, again, the number of students that we have um, being served by school-based behavior contracts and then out-of-district placements. And um, this is a projection of how many of those students could instead be supported by an off-site alternative program if we were able to put something in place. So what this is saying is if we're able to start this and get this up and running next year for year one, we currently could turn three school-based behavior contracts and um, support them on our own and not need to contract with outside agencies because we would have an alternative, more flexible pathway for those students to access their education. What it's showing is we currently have four students who are accessing an alternative school placement and are out of our district um, that we could bring back and we could transition back into BFA if, again, we had an off-site, more flexible alternative program um, for those students to access their education. And we did that um, three years out. So we looked at what we could do in FY24 and what we could do in FY25. So for example, FY25 includes some sixth graders because what we did with FY24 is we looked at all of our high schoolers plus our seventh and eighth graders because those seventh graders would now be ninth graders. So when they transition to BFA, um, out of those students, what is our guesstimation that we wouldn't need those contracts or those alternative placements if we had this additional resource to offer students and families? And then when you look at FY25, it includes sixth graders. So again, we looked at sixth, seventh, and eighth, plus our high schoolers. Um, and what this shows is if you add up all of that, we would have a cost in year one. So um, it would cost us about $70,000 to get this um, going. And then in year two, we would have a savings of about $47,000. And then in year three, we would have an estimated savings around $93,000. Um, and again, this was all done um, in collaboration with those students' teams. So I reached out to the, the teams that work closely with those individual students and had team conversations. Um, and it was a collaborative decision-making process. Does that mean that there's about a hundred thousand dollar net gain by FY25 in terms of 
for budgeting? Yes. And again, it's a projection, but yes. And then this is just, I'm a very visual learner, so if I, anybody prefers visuals like me, this is just a visual to show we would have a cost in year one and then we would have a savings um, in year two plus and hopefully the savings go up year after year. Um, because what this information doesn't show is all of the students that um, we would need to go to an outside contract or an outside placement in the future if we didn't have this as an option because those students are not yet identified, but they could be two, three years from now. What would be the, I guess, what would the numbers have to stay at for, for the services, for the resources that we're gonna hire in order to see those savings? Maybe I'm not understanding. So you said the number of students. So in order to have to keep that savings, say FY25, what does the numbers have to stay at for students? like? That need those resources? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that there's not an easy answer in the sense of the price of the contracts based on the need are all over the map. So we could potentially need to serve one student every year to, to keep that savings going, depending on what contract we would potentially be looking at. Or depending on the need and the type of contracts we're looking, we might need to say we have to look at how we can support four or five kids instead of going to an outside contract. The number of savings could, could kind of be out of the water. I mean, it could all go red if we ended up serving more, correct? Am I, am I seeing that right? Well, if we served more, we would save more. Well, if you serve more in district versus sending a medal. We would, okay. Saving. Yeah, because because okay. right now, unfortunately, the position that we're in is can they navigate BFA and, and the building and, and the, the schedule and the structure of BFA or can't they? And if they can't, we don't have another option. So our, we're left with the option of, okay, then how can we serve these students? And right now the answer is, is there an opening at SOAR or do we contract with Green Mountain and have them come in and do behavior consultation? Whereas this would give us that, all right, let's try this first from a multi-tiered system of support. This is less restrictive. It keeps them tied to BFA. It keeps them in their community. So let's see if we can start here and do this first. What this also doesn't capture is if we, we have a good number of kids that are in residential treatment programs, we are not making those referrals. Um, those referrals are made by the Department of Mental Health or um, the Department of Human Services. And right now, that's a very restrictive setting. So when students return from a residential treatment facility, which a lot of those kids can be in there 12 to 18 plus months, we have no step down and we, we don't have a transition process for them. So they go from a very restrictive environment where every variable is controlled to they're now back here. And they're having to navigate a really large high school um, where the demands are higher and this would give a step down and a transition step for kids to let's start here, let's start slow, and we'll ease them back into the high school. Because we're not a small high school, we're, we're huge. Um, and there's some kids that they, they might not rise, you know, in our behavior data, but our anxiety and depression is on the rise and the environment itself can be very stimulating. Um, so having them in a smaller environment um, can be very, helpful and therapeutic with that's where the engagement comes in um, they would come in and they would access us i think more frequently so i think i'm right if i'm saying this tell me if i'm saying this correctly right now you, you have identified four students in fy23 that would require out of district placement that could go to this alternative program instead. You have actually four. So we have four that are currently out of district that we can bring back if we had this option in place. Okay, so this has nothing to do with any projected other possible, well, not even projected, like some new, new diagnoses or new IEPs or new. No, because I don't know those yet. I can tell you that if you, if you look at the history, the need is going up. And how many students can that alternative 
program serve with so what so what we are proposing as a committee, and again, if you click on that link, that'll take you to that table. Um, but we're, we're saying that we would max out with 20 students. But I want to be really mindful and transparent that it's a flexible pathway. So those are 20 students that would be there full time. So it could serve more because not all of those students are gonna to need to be there all day, every day. There are a lot of students that might need to be there for a period or a half a day or a couple periods a day and they can come over here and do half their classes. Um, so we have a lot of kids that if they're doing well and they're thriving in certain parts of their day and in classes, we wouldn't take that from them, but they might need an alternative setting for parts of their day. So what we said is that we would max out at 20 full-time slots and five part-time slots would equal one full-time spot. And when we went and looked at spaces, um, the spaces that we've looked at, that would be a reasonable request. You could have, you could support that number of students and not feel um, like it was cramped or that they weren't spread out and they didn't have their own working areas. Yes, Brett. I say also the location is close by. It allows um, well, people like me to quickly visit, meet with the students and offer a much better transition than right now, which is a very abrupt transition. They're located pretty far away from us, then brought back. And this also utilizes the resources of the school in a different manner. So while we have great resources here, if it's located nearby, we can utilize some of those and that eases transition for, I think, every kid. So for many of these kids, it's gonna be, the goal would be to return to the high school. And this is much better off than anything that's currently out there. And I'm really glad that you brought that up. The other piece I forgot to add is um, this year we've added additional resources in terms of BFA now has a behavior consultant on staff and on board. And we have a family engagement specialist to help us with the truancy and the um, attendance concerns. So those positions would be able to go back and forth between BFA and the alternative program. So it's not an exclusionary program in the sense of if you're in the alternative program, you don't have access to the resources at BFA. Those folks would still be working. And then we have Ashley Olio, who's an amazing social worker, and she would be able to come over and do groups with students and still meet um, with the students in the alternative program. Yeah, we, f we feel like we need an additional one, but we also have Ashley that could help out with that if the need extends beyond. Uh, DFA has been there before. Uh, we've had the alternative program and we had it away from BFA. Uh, is this going to be in similar fashion? So my understand, this is, that was before my time, um, but in talking to staff, um, that has hurt BFA a lot, um, that that was removed. Um, so that's why there's a lot of advocacy for staff to bring something back. But my understanding is that was, all, was that also a special ed program? I think there was both. Okay. Yeah, before my time as well. Yeah, but. it was both, yeah. So this is really trying to bring it back in a, in a different but similar way based on our current needs, because I would imagine the needs years ago. Yeah, this is exactly the way it ran the last time. Where the students could go uh, to the alternative program if they have a bad day in the classroom uh, if they're having a good day. Yeah, and I know staff, like I said, from a, the staff's perspective, they have felt the absence of that option now that it no longer exists. Oh, I know that no longer exists. I'm just I saying think there were um, actually two or three different alternative programs, depending on what the reason you were in the alternative program. Because I think there was a <clears throat> new beginning place that was down by where the central office is now. And then I think there was something on campus here somewhere that addressed the needs of another population of more. Um, <clears throat> yeah. 
what did you call it? Summit. Summit. Yes, thank you. And <laughs> I remember when the proposal came through to eliminate some of those programs, the reason was the high cost and the difficulty of finding people that were trained and, and able to, you know, be hired for those positions. But. Yeah, I mean, the staffing is always an unknown, especially right now. I mean, we can try, yeah. um, but there's obviously no guarantee that we're going to have applicants or qualified applicants. Um, but the need is not, I understand the money piece of it. I come from the student centered perspective. Um, the needs are not decreasing. They're, they're intensifying and they're becoming more complex um, and we're losing more and more students by having to send them out for services that I think we are fully capable of providing if we had the right resources and space to do it. I see the student population as being a, a group of kids who would never ever need this, a group of kids who definitely need it. And there's a good group side group in the middle that could use something like this. But sometimes when you sit down in a meeting, it's like, well, do we send them off? They're not quite there yet. So do we send them away? And what's the cost of that? And I think this is a, a great place to, to use the word equity, to give those kids what they need at a very reasonable cost and without totally sending them away from the community. Yeah, and it's not um, a permanent solution in the sense of that's where that um, discharge process is going to be key. So the goal is always going to be transitioning them back here and having them come back here. And that's going to take a short amount of time for some kids. It's going to take a long time for other kids, depending on the need. Right, um, and all the other alternative programs, like if you're in Novus, I would say less than 10% of our students leave Novus entirely. We, we, we may have kids that come in as freshmen and are with us the entire time, but it's really rare that anybody leaves. We're, the 20 kids we're talking about having, the 20 slots would be very fluid. And I, I think it'd be great. I think it would catch a lot more kids than just 20. And it wouldn't be a static thing for four years. They wouldn't be there. Go ahead. Um, question I have is you, you have on here uh, special educators. And so um, I guess I was thinking that this would be specifically for students who are not on IEPs. We envisioned it, we envisioned it as a, everybody would be, have access to it. So there would be people that were on special education plans, but they would keep their, their case managers outside of the program. And, and they would be allowed to come in, but that wouldn't fit everybody on a special education plan. Isn't it? I'm not sure what you're looking at, but there wouldn't be a special educator. Um, at what you told us to look at, staffing proposal. So it says special educators, current case manager will maintain caseload. Yep. yep. So that's same as like guidance counselors, special educators. So if it's a student on an IEP, they would not be excluded from accessing this program. They, but they would not be staffed by a special educator in that building. They would maintain their current special ed case manager at BFA. So you could have somebody in the learning. Is that you just showed us two programs, right? Novus and SIP, yep. saying that those are programs specifically designed for special education students. My question is, I was under the impression that this alternative program here would be for non-IEP kids since you already have options for IEP kids, is what I'm saying. There's some, there's some students in special education where none of the existing programs would be appropriate for them. So they can access this program. We're intentionally not making it exclusionary to anyone. So they could be on an IEP, they could be on a 504, or they could just have an, an educational support plan. But there are students that are currently supported in the learning center, let's say, for example, that there are conversations about whether that's the least restrictive environment for them. So again, it would be a step for those students, or before we talk about Laraway, or before we bring in an outside contract, we could have this and they would maintain their current case manager. And I appreciate that. I guess what my question would be, how would you determine the criteria and how would you determine like, you know, percentage in terms of IEP kids versus not IEP kids? Because I think the original, it sounded to me like the original intent was designing a place for those students who are not receiving IEP services that were kind of falling in the crack there, right? 
So that's what I'm hearing from you. And I think that's awesome. And I'm, the concern would be that when it goes into practice that we get our focus becomes more on saving money, right? Mm -hmm. Than it does on serving the population of students who do not currently have services because they don't fit the criteria for an IEP. Yeah, I appreciate that question and I really appreciate that perspective. And I think that's where our MTSS framework would come into play as well as the referral process. So um, kids are not just gonna be able to be placed in this alternative program. There's gonna be an entire process that is data driven to justify and to show the need. And um, we have a standing committee um, that meet every week around our multi-tiered systems of support that review those referrals. And that's where those conversations would happen is we would really think about, okay, what is this student currently accessing? Is there anything else more appropriate you know, aside from this alternative program because there are more options available to students on IEPs than general education students. So that, that is a conversation to be determined in the sense of it would be part of the referral process that we have not um, completed yet as a committee because we didn't want to dive into that work if this wasn't an option to come to fruition. Yeah, and that would just impact my feedback, I guess is what I'm saying. Because it's really easy to, it's really easy to quickly absorb IEP kids into this program and then you're not meeting the needs of who you intended it for to begin with. Yes. Yep. Jack has a question. So it's really, it's really a statement. I think this is a fantastic proposal. As Joanna said, I'm not concerned about the money. If it saves money, fantastic. But we need to serve kids well. And I think keeping kids in the community, like some other board members have said, and <clears throat> um, it looks like you really thought this out and you're going to continue to do that with your, your committee. Um, and it looks like uh, it's a fantastic idea. And I understand that some special ed kids need the other programs, perhaps. And some would need this and some regular ed kids would need this kind of a program. So, uh, Wow, I think it's fantastic. Hopefully it'll save a little bit of money, but that's this board member, that's not my concern. My concern is serving kids well. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I think like any system and any proposal, it's a work in progress. And even once, if we are able to get something in place, I can guarantee you after year one, we're gonna have to come back to the drawing board because we're gonna have learned a lot of things and we're gonna have learned things that we missed and that we need to tweak. And that's why those committee members, plus some, are dedicated to doing this work long-term. And, and we have committee members that know what it looked like when different alternative programs were in place in the past. So they are coming with that perspective um, and they have that historical knowledge to help those of us that don't and weren't here. Thank you. Does anyone else have questions? Great. Yeah. So um, you know, like some of the other board members, I, I appreciate the vision and I think how it ties into some of the other curriculum stuff that we've seen. Um, my question is, uh, you know, everything that's within your control, I think you've done an amazing job with. The things that I see that are outside your control, the hiring and the space um, is concerning. And I'm wondering if you have a contingency plans. So if you're able to get the space to other hires, could, is there a version of this that you can do with no additional staff for a year or two? Um, or if you're able to get the hires but not the space, have you guys considered those types of contingencies? So those are really great questions. And I, my answer would be that's where we are today. So that's where we are right now. And I know those conversations have started also with Bill and Martha and Brett in the sense of, okay, but what if? And what are our plan B and what is our plan C? So I don't have the answers to that yet. Um, but that's where our mindset is and that's where we're thinking and trying to troubleshoot. Okay. So I, I can speak to that and I was gonna end at the end of this presentation, but I wanna let everyone else have a chance if they have questions of Alexis or Elijah. So I can talk to you about what the next steps are that we need, we need some help from the board. So I wanted to talk about that. We have a location that uh, we are time sensitive that is right within walking distance of the school, which is perfect. Um, 
And as the board has the statutory requirement to approve any real estate, at the next board meeting, we'll be coming to you with a action, needing an action by the board to approve us to lease a space. Uh, the person we're working with has been gracious enough to give us some time, but does have other tenants that are interested in the space and wants to work with BFA. So I'll be bringing that at the next meeting. Uh, well, I should say Alexis and I, because she's done all the work, all I'm doing is supporting her. Uh, but in looking at that space, and we wanted to give you some time to understand the program before we brought you that contract uh, and to look for board approval. I cannot approve that as a superintendent statutorily. I like the idea of it being in walking distance personally instead of the vans. And that just we, I, yeah. that's unanimous. <laughs> that's oh, unanimous okay. I thought here. I thought the vans everybody was on board. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. That that's our that was our start of our plan B. That if we need a plan B, this is what it could look like. That is not as ideal. Okay. So are you expecting that when we come next month or next meeting that you might have some uh, some skeleton plan B? We have some skeleton plan B for that. The, part, the hardest part is it with any industry, and you've heard it from me since last June, I think. We're having a hiring issue. We're working on that one <laughs> as best we is. can. Yeah. Um, and so, but we don't want to lose the space because it's going to take some time to get the space up to speed. And if we can do even a kit or two this second semester, we're going to try that. Alexis and I have had that conversation, but it really depends on staffing. Yeah. So, so just a comment with a number of vacant storefronts in St. Albans. I can't believe that that one spot is the choice spot of everyone else other than DFA. Um, that maybe it is, because it's got parking. I just, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's going to be really important, at least for me, to yeah. know how that space can be used with the current staff. If if we were to get it and not be able to hire. OK. We'll bring you that. Question. We'll yeah. bring you that. Alternatives to that space if it doesn't. Yeah. All right, so we have a we have a plan for next meeting, right? To come forward, you, <coughs> Alexa, team. Thank you so much for Thank the presentation. You. Thank you. The board has any questions, additional questions? Can you um, email Bill and he'll disseminate and copy me, please? And he'll disseminate that through. Um, okay, moving back to our regular agenda. Um, we're going to go to what is now item six, old business and COVID update. And Bill's going to give us a COVID update. Update. Yes. Um, I want to appreciate, uh, I'm not sure, if Anna Roberts' question. Uh, I think it's a really valid one. We have had uh, quite a few um, positive COVID cases, especially in town school. Um, over the past couple of weeks. As I see in the community numbers and I see in our schools, our numbers are rising quite a bit. We've had families that have not had to quarantine just once or twice, but some three times. Some, some students three times. Um, so that's really uh, concerning to all of us on the leadership team. I know I can speak for everyone and say that. Um, just as of today, our current reality is that we have 131 students out on quarantine right now. So all, we, all, four, schools, all four schools, that's okay. the total of all four schools. I'm not going to break it down by no, school. You don't have to no, no, I just I want to protect the privacy as sure. much as I can. Of course. Um, I will tell you that at the high school with vaccinations that we have, we don't see as anywhere near the number of quarantines. And that's true in the seventh and eighth grades as well at, at the other three schools. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like to say it's like, and this is guessing from conversations with fellow administrators, uh, in the, it's somewhere in the 50% range in the seven, eighth grades and higher in the high school, um, of when we have, you know, how many students can come back yeah. and, and not be in quarantine. Uh, we're all excited to, at least I'm excited. I think I can say that for my colleagues as well as, is when the vaccine gets approved for younger students, that'll be great. <laughs> Um, but until that time, and that's going to take a while to get in place, even if it does come in the next two or three weeks from what they're, I hear on the news, there's a new program in Vermont that you've probably heard of, Test to Stay. Test to Stay is a program we want to put in place. It is quite personnel intensive. And so we are trying to figure that out. 
I want to say just as of this afternoon, the city is willing to partner with us and help us um, with some possible locations and traffic flow. Uh, luckily, uh, last week I was at, or two weeks ago, I was at the New England Superintendents Conference. Massachusetts is about six weeks in front of us with this program and talked with several superintendents down there and how they put it in place so we're not starting from scratch. Uh, so we started that conversation last week as a leadership team and tomorrow we'll be going into it. I hope by Friday I'll be putting something out to the community about that program. Um, and so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and people found, I talked to school districts about the same <coughs> size of ours and they, one of the biggest things they said is centralize it. Don't try to do it at every school. You, just, you can't staff it. So. We're working on some good things on that. Um, we would like to get that because we, I agree with everything Ms. Roberts said <laughs> about what's happening to families, what's happening to kids, kids out of school. We, we don't want that. So uh, the big thing, as I said, is the personnel and the organization of it. And, and I want to thank Aaron and John. They've been doing a lot of reading the materials along with Joan uh, and helping us put a proposal together that we're bringing tomorrow morning to the leadership team from where we were. The other part of that is we don't have all the details from the state of Vermont yet on how it is to be on all the implementation pieces and the actual uh, releases to make that happen. So we're hoping that will come soon. Is that a, is that a supervisory union um, or a school district decision or is that? It's a school district decision. Uh, we already know and uh, Heather Ann's online and I think she'll be fine with me saying uh, we're going to run Fairfield out of Fairfield, and we're going to have a central location for town, city, and BFA Northwest Tech. So that's we we've made that decision already. Yeah, good. Thanks, Heather Ann. <laughs> she said I can. She can handle. They can handle up at Fairfield for Fairfield. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to make Fairfield residents come all the way down and have right. to go back up. The other thing we heard from our Massachusetts colleagues, and they experienced this. They started it like right before school, and that was too late in the morning. That you actually really needed early, early. So like 6, 6.30, 7.30 latest, because people need to get to work. Yeah, that was going to be my follow-up question. Yep. So planning to make sure parents have time and notice and can get their kids yep. scheduled and yep. tested. And, yep. and we're going for good. We're not going for perfect. And that's what the Massachusetts <laughs> folks said to us. They start, a couple of them started really trying to be perfect and get everyone and do it for everybody. And, two of, and one of them said, well, we learned that was the wrong way to do it because we didn't get it implemented. It took us longer to implement it. So go for good and then make it better each week. So that's the way we're going to do it, is we're going to try to get as many as we can, but we know we won't get everybody right away. So, um, and, and thinking about that through an equitable lens as well, because um, we, need, we need some support. And I think parents will step up. I know they'll step up because they would rather have their kids in school than at home. And I know that they share, we shared parent um, experience, but I think, I, I hope I can say from the hospital experience, this is a big deal for urgent care. It's a big deal for the COVID Resource Center. We, we have resources that are really strapped right now, and for this to be in place is a big deal. Yeah, we're not going to be able to do everything the governor yeah, promised. I understood. We, I, I just have to be really clear about that. We do not have the staffing to do everything that he promised publicly. and. I know there are some school districts that can't do it at all. Yeah. And, and, and frankly, right now, I sit here today with not knowing any of the staffing and who's going to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge issue that we have to come over. We'll get there, I'm confident. And if we need to ask for volunteers, we'll ask for volunteers outside our staff. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's what I can say for you right now. That's our COVID update. Um, Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, next item on the agenda is committee for negotiations. We need to appoint an educational support staff committee members. I'd like, um, I, we actually need a motion to do this. Yeah. I, I, th I thought I could do this. Oh, well, that's what you talked about last time yeah, yeah. as a chair. You okay. Appoint. Um, so I'd like a motion to appoint Jack, Joanna, and Al to the educational support staff committee members for negotiations. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I selected people that told me they wanted to do it, so <laughs> <laughs> hopefully there's not a whole lot of discussion. Uh, okay, all in favor of the motion, signify by saying uh, Jack. Yes. Al. Uh, yes. Gina. Yes. Susan. Yes. Joanna. Yes. Grant. Yes. Felicia. Yes. Peter. Yes. I don't think we got Katie ever, right? 
and Nelda, yes. Okay. And then, uh, thank you for that. Motion carries. We need a committee. Let's see, I need a motion to appoint uh, Susan, Grant, Nina, and Nilda to the professional staff committee members for negotiations, please. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and second. Uh, again, people that uh, offered to do it. So, Jack. Yes. Al. No. Nina. Yes. Susan. Yes. Joanna. Yes. Grant. Yes. Alicia. Yes. Peter. Yes. And Nelda, yes. Thank you all for your volunteerism. Okay. Next, um, we're going to um, be setting up uh, meetings and stuff, and uh, we are going to have a need to go into executive session at the end uh, for negotiation prep. And I think it's because we will definitely um, have a finding that premature public knowledge would place the board at a substantial disadvantage. So we'll have that discussion in executive session later. And when we get to that, we'll talk about who needs to be there. Um, next item on the agenda is 6D, implicit bias and anti-racism training. Uh, Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yep. Um, I don't know. What I first wanted to do was see, and I just want to see which way I go with this. Uh, at the last meeting, we talked about reading the article of system change and governance for school boards that lead for equity. Have people had a chance to look that over? Started. Started it? Started it. Okay. So I think um, what Ryer Erickson was speaking about in his, um, in his public comment points <clears throat> to some of the things that came in this article uh, about a board looking for and talking about here. So I would ask for those who've had a chance to, to look at it, what were some of the things that you got out of it? I made some notes. Oh, good, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the first thing that I noticed was really a call to action for um, school board members to be seen as stewards of education investment made by the communities. And I think we talk about this a lot, about the public good, right? The, the cost, the budget investment of things and then I made a lot of other a lot of other notes but I think the key to this for me was around um, the commitment the shared commitment to eliminate the predictability of student achievement based on false beliefs that associate the ability of a student with their race ethnicity and poverty it's so important that those characteristics do not define a kid's path before they even step foot in one of our buildings and so this was my big, big takeaway. Someone else from? I was going to say I read the same thing and it was like, like a light bulb. Yeah. Yeah. And as some, you know, like being in a school, oftentimes somebody will say, what's their last name? Who are they related to? Oh my gosh, when yeah. was their last sibling here? And we've already constructed, you know, their their ability to succeed. Yep. And to um, yeah. So that's important. And it's true. Like I think about that for healthcare. I mean, the same thing happens for me. You know, when you start thinking about your ability to succeed based on you know who they're connected to. Are not connected to. Yeah. I think we can all say that, you know, if those of us who have siblings, that we're not the same people just because they're our siblings. <laughs> Doesn't mean that we're all going to share the same path in life. So it's important mm -hmm. to give kids chances and to have to set the bar higher. What were some of the other, what was maybe a, another piece there that talked about school board actions besides that setting that vision, that, that vision for the district that you spoke of? I think part of it was the intentionally providing the different levels of support. So what Alexis is present, oh, Elijah is present. Elijah, yeah. Um, about tonight around making sure that we have methods and tools. It's not enough to think it not enough to say it we have to do something about it yeah. and so it's our it ultimately is our responsibility to make sure the district has what they needed either in policy or financial support or whatever we need to put into place to make sure that this is able to be achieved and 
that also makes me think about special education in terms of it's it's always a fine line in terms of you know advocating for students and families to be able to receive the support that they're due and working within the framework and resources that we have and it's <laughs> who does the advocating for what they they really need not just stopping on what the resource that, that the school currently has does that make sense mm -hmm. it also speaks to some of the work that we've started in our retreat conversations around we want reports we want data we want data but there's a really there's another kind of jarring line that says um, inspect what we expect and I think you've said that but it when, it, when I read it, it meant more, no, I'm just going to say. That's okay. <laughs> but the, just we need to make sure we look at the right things, broaden our lens and make sure we're looking at the right data and making sure we're looking at the right indicators to say, how are we judging this? If this is a new intervention, this is a different approach, how are we measuring it? How do we know if we've been successful? How do we know? So, you know, when I read it, I was looking at it I think mainly from a governance and procedure and logistics perspective, um, you know, and how do we do that here, which I see some challenges um, because it needs to be sort of uh, applied on an individual, you know, everything needs to be applied basically on an individualized basis, right, to make sure that we're doing the right thing for each student, um, which I worry that we don't necessarily um, you know that that's that's something of a departure from how things have have been done in this district. I think in the past, um, you know, and so we need to start moving in that direction. Um, and I, I didn't necessarily see the answers in this particular article um, and how we're going to apply that here. Uh, so I think that is going to be the challenge: is how to proceduralize to make sure that we are doing the right thing for the individual. Um, moving forward um, without trying to get into the, you know, um, like the majority rule kind of aspect of it, right, which we've had trouble with in the past, right? Uh, so uh, that, that was an example, though. So are you, are you talking about, like, moving from this idea of doing what's for the greater good versus looking at people? It's understanding what the greater good is. Yeah. Right, so you have value, right, with these systems for equity yeah. um, that need to be uh, sort of uh, more than conceptualized, right? They need they need to be well understood to the point where they can be communicated and supported, um, you know, in a way that you can very easily uh, point to all the the benefits, right, in a way that that makes it clear that we're making good decisions, right, um, that, that are really for the betterment of the community. Um, all of the community. All of the community, right, uh, in, in a way that all of the community can support and understand, right, why it makes sense to spend these resources, uh, you know, in a way that maybe we hadn't previously, right. You can spend, um, you know, some fraction of, of our budget and 80% of the kids will benefit greatly, right. And 20% get left behind, and that's the system we need to get away from, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And you need to, but but the 80% that benefit, right, are probably, you know, the children of the payers, right? Just the way that the demographics work out. Um, and so you need to, we need to, we need to make it clear, um, you know, that, that there is community benefit here, and it does make sense to to build these programs. And like I said, I don't think the answers were in that article, but that, that's what I kept coming back to as I was reading. Is that, that is the challenge. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I pointed to this first was not to have the answers. Right? Yeah. But to say, because <laughs> they get contextualized. Yes. They do. And yeah. you have to know your community, and you have to know the details of the community, and then you also, but it does point to looking at both inputs and outputs. Mm -hmm. And for the board to understand that, you've asked for that in your reports. And it's also said to take that through a lens of looking at it 
uh, they just called it weighted measures. In Vermont, we talk about the weighting factor for students. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at that and what the needs are of different subsets within the district. Uh, and then and being transparent with that data. And then also they talked about a policy piece in here for the board. I will tell you the social emotional learning equity and re restorative practices committee is working on one that's a model from VSA, VSBA uh, piece that they're using for their work. And I think at some point they'll need to come and present that to you as a board. But I also think you're going to need community input on that as well. So one of the things that I would encourage all of you to do from reading on this, one uh, person that Vermont superintendents have been working with is Lavelle Brown. Dr. Brown is the uh, superintendent of Ithaca, New York schools, and he's a speaker for the Vermont School Boards and <coughs> Vermont Superintendents Association. So it had, that conference has been made virtual, and it's from four to six on Thursday night, the fourth. And I can sign us up as a group and you could all have access to it. Okay. I've, seen, I've seen his presentations a couple of times. I think he's excellent. I know Joan was with me at the last one, uh, and Angelo and Jason were as well, um, and, uh, and Stacy, and Heather Ann. I'm forgetting everyone who's there with me. But um, <laughs> he, uh, he does a, he's great about saying that we're not perfect, but we've been working on this for a while. Mm -hmm. And kind of how do you take that lens at the super, at the, uh, school district level uh, and so I would really encourage you to, to see that I also know that you all received an email uh, from a community member about some resources just on equity itself I will say that what I gave you last time is really pointed towards the school board's role uh, and I encourage you to look at that uh, we are trying to look into consultants to come and work someone facilitated a discussion on equity with you as a board, and I think it should be someone from the outside. The hard part for us right now is, uh, as probably many of you know, they're very booked up. Uh, but we're still working on that. I wish I had an answer for you on that tonight, but I don't. But I heard you loud and clear last time. And I would suggest, uh, Nilda, that we keep this on the, on the agenda, uh, and we could figure out a reading or a movie, but we could look at that uh, Dr. Lavelle's, Dr. Brown's um, presentation is the day after our next board meeting. So. so I think you should sign us up and then get it in our calendar. Yep, we can do that. We can I, go that route. Yes, Aaron, who takes care of all of us. Oh, I see him making a note right now. <laughs> <laughs> note to self. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank I have you. one quick question. Yes. At the last meeting, you talked about the Ithaca School District. Yep. And, and I was able to find exactly what you were yeah. talking about. What was that? Because I can't find it. It's an equity dashboard that they oh, have okay. on their on their site. And they okay. used it last year because they didn't have any standardized assessments that went across the district. They okay. used a lot of their parental ser parental and student surveys. Oh, okay. To, and that's what they show up there now. And he actually explained that really well this summer. It was really okay. beautiful to see. And they look at each school and uh, look at it at the school level. And then you disaggregate it by different subgroups. And you can do that right there. I would like to get there. We have some work with our data systems to get ourselves there. Maybe, I don't know, Nelda, maybe at another meeting we can talk about is the intention that people are doing their own and choosing their own education and then sharing it back? Are we all doing the same thing and then reporting back? I just want to have a clear expectation. Yeah, we, we talked about that a little bit last yeah, meeting. Yeah, I, I read the, yeah. yeah. And I think the, the idea was everybody kind of wanted to do it together as much as we could and bring a speaker in, although nobody's opposed to doing an outside meeting, but <clears throat> we thought it would be good <clears throat> for us and the public to see, see and hear what we learn and also get the opportunity to see and hear it also. That was my understanding. Did, did I interpret that correctly? Those that, I learned a lot from discussion. Yeah, just yeah and you mentioned that actually last time. Yep. That, that's good. So I think that's the plan, although there, you know, I mean, no one's going to say don't read anything on your own, obviously, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, no, no. Don't learn any of that. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So um, we'll keep this on the agenda and follow up next time. Yep. Okay. Moving on, we're up to item 7A. And um, 
What I need is a motion to grant the superintendent the authorization to approve the Northwest Career and Technical Center FY22 VACTED. Is that how you say that word? It's an, ac it's an acronym. How come it's not in caps? Then? It should have been. Oh, it's okay. Because um, I'm like, is that like a, no. I don't know, <laughs> consortium uh, agreement? Yeah. Please, can I have that motion? Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. <laughs> Discussion. So I'll give two seconds and then my colleague Leanne Wright will fill you in a lot more. Until this academic year, this is something the superintendents could approve, and it's now being required to go up to the school boards to approve for all tech centers. This is, and you'll help me. Why don't you take it on from sure. there, Leanne? Because otherwise I will <coughs> yep. screw it up. That it stands for Vermont Association for Career and Technical Education Directors, and so we're all part of a consortium where we pool money from our Perkins uh, federal grant money that we get um, awarded every year. And the pooling um, of money goes towards activities, such as uh, the career and technical education programs for all the new teachers that come into CTE. And also um, there's uh, CTSOs that are state and, federal, state and national activities and conferences that our students attend. And so that's all of the technical centers in the state of Vermont that do that. So we, we all put a portion of money into this consortium, and it pays for those activities. So they want to, what we want is the board to approve that the superintendent can sign this. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of twisted converse words there. So mm -hmm. we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll take poll. Jack. Yes. Al. Yes. Dina. Yes. Susan. Yes. Joanna. Yes. Grant. Yes. Leisha. Yes. Peter. Yes. And Nilda, yes. Thank you. Okay, motion carries. Thank you all. Next item on the agenda is 7C, and that is the facilities plan report. And Bill and Hunter are going to do that yeah. presentation for us. Yeah. So I'd like to introduce Hunter Gomez. He works for Peterson Consulting. Hunter has been with us. <laughs> Hunter's been with us for what almost two years now, Hunter, with construction projects. Yes. Yeah. yeah, he's been our clerk of the works. And one of the things that we asked Hunter and his and he'll talk more about Peterson Consulting, the work they've done, is to take a look at our facilities and give us an assessment of where we are at and looking at uh, what would it take to keep our facilities up to speed is probably the best way to do it. He'll tell you more about that um, and talk to you about the, oops. You're gonna have to go onto PowerPoint and tell it just to share the, share the screen. Yeah, it's working here, but not on Zoom. I'll, I'll figure it out. Okay. Keep, keep going, sorry. Um, so Hunter, I'm not sure what, because I know you're going to explain the process yeah. and what we did with everyone, so I don't know much more that I would have to say, but uh, as I think most of you know, one of the subtasks that I keep is the facilities work, just because I have background in that area before I became an educator. Uh, so Hunter's been invaluable to myself, and I can tell you I've heard it from every facilities manager in the district, director in the district, they've said Hunter's been invaluable to them in doing not only this work, but looking at things for uh, Vermont efficiency and water, uh, storm water issues and others as well, along with Laz Gangas, but Hunter's been really leading that work. Well, that's, uh, that's a very kind preamble, and thank you very much for our bill. It kind of steals my thunder, because I was going to kick that back to the, the whole rest of the facilities team. Um, but to introduce myself, I'm Hunter Gomez, uh, Senior Project Manager at Peterson Consulting, and like Bill said, we started working with the district uh, on two projects in 2019, in the fall of 2019, which would be the BFA Connector Project and the Fairfield Art and Music Edition Project. Uh, a little background about me, I started Peterson Consulting in 2019 after moving back uh, with my wife from Idaho. Before that, I was construction superintendent, project manager, uh, now uh, Vermont licensed property inspector, and like I said, I've been with the district kind of 
on and off for a variety of projects since 2019. So have pretty much had some exposure before starting this project uh, at most of the facilities, whether it be Fairfield, uh, BFA, or St. Tech Sachs or Collins Purley, some of these other projects and got to know everyone. So that was obviously quite beneficial and just there's a lot of area to cover here and you have a lot of a lot of facilities. So that was a great start and then obviously as kind of Bill alluded to, working with the you have some incredible staff here that has a really good handle on what's going on and obviously a lot of ground to cover for very limited folks. Um, so uh, Len, Bill obviously was at a lot of those meetings. Len and Tim, Len is the facility director here at BFA as you probably know. Tim uh, at Collins Curley, so they're, they're both here in the back. Big thanks to them. Um, and then obviously we got Derek Madden at Satec, Albert at uh, Fairfield, and Frank Kelke is <coughs> kind of filling in for uh, Robin Bordeaux had been at Sachs. Uh, they really got us off to an incredible start with this because they're a lot of the lists were already in place, so we were kind of documenting things, and we'll go through that process in the next slide uh, through a, a flow chart to talk through that. But it was really highly beneficial and really streamlined the process. Um, so really where we went, we started with, we kicked this off uh, in the late spring, and then really the first phase was like I was getting at uh, interviews with all the facility directors. We went through the lists of what the known problems were, um, kind of the, the things that they would like to target, uh, upgrades that they'd be liking, liking to do, things like you know increased programming size or circulation, things of that nature. Um, kind of getting a lay of the land in terms of the various, this, this, this facility in particular uh, has had multiple additions as you, you well know, and kind of trying to trace all those pieces together. Uh, from there, uh, through last gang, so Skango, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Arnold and, uh, Arnold and Skanks Architects, no. Yeah, yeah you got it. Yeah. Yeah. Arnold, yeah. Arnold and Skanks. Um, they, working with them in engineering services of Vermont, um, we, we kind of repeated the process to some degree, but with a look at the HVAC equipment, because with COVID being such a, a primary concern, air exchanges, ventilation, things of that nature, went through uh, with Dan Dupris, and really they, we looked at every piece of equipment in every facility, which was very, very helpful with a, engineering eye for certain and they kind of independently uh, worked up these HVAC, these <coughs> HVAC prices uh, to build into the, the spreadsheet which we'll talk about later and then on the third phase kind of along the same lines each facility director uh, myself and two representatives from Efficiency Vermont kind of went through those lists and fine-tuned them for how to increase the efficiency while also maximizing all the things everyone's been talking about, the air exchanges, the um, various new ways to heat buildings, cool buildings, uh, and, th and they're working on some independent reports we actually haven't even got back yet, which would be supplementary to this. Um, and then I went through and documented all the stuff we had talked about, uh, which is where the, the executive summary that you all received last week is a snapshot of that much larger document. Um, and from there, we went through and we now have the narrative summary, which is where the executive uh, and all the reports where the executive summary was generated from, and also a master spreadsheet for with a 20 year look ahead um, using the HVAC pricing, existing quotes that all the facility managers have generated that, and of the things they were known about, and then a bunch of uh, rough order magnitude costs for, for the various projects. And we can take a look at that. And that's really a living document to be used as you know, projects become more defined or um, the, the costs change and that has to be adjusted. So that's really a yearly, five year maximum, I would say, adjustment. We can take a look at that. And that's really where the overall uh, report stems from. And now just to kind of go through each facility, not to say that this is everything uh, that we covered by HSC Imagination, but just kind of an overview and then some photos to, to talk through the items. Um, BFA St. Albans, you know, 220,000 uh, square feet, and we're showing on the spreadsheet a uh, fiscal need for capital improvements of uh, 10 and a half million essentially. There's some areas, we'll go through some pictures uh, concerning fail, failed areas of brick, uh, window improvements and replacements, particularly these, which we've got some pictures of those. Um, roofs, obviously, like we talked about the HVAC equipment, a lot, in a lot of cases, original to the facilities, um, which is 
at various stages of construction, but at or has exceeded its, its, its useful life expectancy. Um, really very limited air conditioning, which is not, hadn't been such a concern in Vermont, and now it's a, a forefront issue for every new school project we address. A lot of uh, air sealing and insulation things. This is kind of a, uh, really was standard to the, the age of construction when they did it, and now we just know a lot more about that. And when you can control the interior environment, uh, you don't want to have those air, air exchanges. And then accessibility is issues uh, and lighting upgrades and some elevator stuff, which is also included. So here's some North Campus photos. Um, this is this is outside of this this building here. We've got some brickwork that's obviously <coughs> in decline and needs to be addressed. Uh, this is a example of these windows here where we've got weather intrusion. Uh, that's a, we had looked at that as a function of the connector project and have been doing some research on that with uh, Laz as well. This would be the piece of equipment you might have uh, heard kick on earlier <laughs> during the, the first presentation. So this is, you know, has had some minor upgrades and has, has kept running and has uh, additional controls now, but obviously it was more or less that mezzanine was built around it. So it's, it's original to the new, ho new hospital, as we call it. This roof here, uh, 1993, I believe we traced that back to, and that's a generally, you know, 25, maybe 30 year roof. So these are the, these are the big ticket items. And obviously ins insulation underneath uh, had been fine, and now we've probably two to three generations of energy code removed from that when that was installed. Uh, South Campus, similarly some, some brick stuff. Windows that uh, aren't sealing. Um, accessibility, this is no longer, was fine when it was constructed, obviously, and now it's is, uh, not, doesn't meet uh, modern accessibility standards. Uh, like I was saying, insulation, this was common at the time in 1930, but very difficult in the attic of the original high school to control your environment when you don't have insulation in the, in the attic space. And another, similarly in the original high school, this was, this was high tech, uh, Mechanical ventilation at the time, it, it does work. It's a chimney system um, where the hot air rises and the cold air falls, but it's, it's just it's outdated at this point. Um, and it serves its purpose, but it's a little bit past its prime. Collins Burley, they do an incredible job over there with what they do for certain. Um, serves the entire community, and I remember growing up in the Moyle County wishing we had something like that. Um, a bit of levity, a contentious point between my father and I, so he wouldn't take me to play hockey there as a child. <laughs> um, 77,000 plus or minus square feet, obviously exterior stuff uh, leads, leads that measurement to be a little bit skewed as well. Similar, similar fiscal need, um, windows and doors, original, parking lots, more or less original, building envelope uh, upgrades, obviously different than things were in 1985. Um, Hunter, can I? Similar. Hunter, I think that fiscal need is wrong. I, I think, think that one might have carried over. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that carried over from last slide. It should be four million. Yeah. Two hundred thousand. It's here. correct in your report. Yeah. 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 Be, that was, that was there, so. yeah. Once we get to the total. More of that. More of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but similar needs, lighting upgrades. Um, we've got some pictures. We've got uh, sidewalk, parking lot areas with uh, trip hazards at the curb, um, doors that without proper with a drop of the egress, um, areas of the building envelope that by no fault of anyone at the district is just uh, at the point where we're starting to see leaks and, and water intrusion in the windows that don't quite sit right because they're um, 35 plus years old at this point. So some, some items such as that. Uh, Fairfield Center School, uh, similar to this, has had multiple iterations over the years, originally 1964. Uh, the bulk of the classroom space added in 1988. Um, and obviously, we had the art music project, 31,000 square feet. Um, we're showing three and a half plus million of things, and a lot of the similar issues with uh, exterior doors and windows that were original at the at the oldest. Um, that would be 55 years old plus or minus, and still 30 uh, plus at the at the newer ones. Similar with the windows. And uh, a big problem there, which is a safety issue that we've discussed amongst ourselves, is there just wasn't a lot of outlets, um, so they have problems with power up there. Um, HVAC stuff is similarly, as we've discussed, boilers uh, that were that are original are 
or extend or extended life at this point. Um, and the controls, we have issues with balancing up there. We, we can't control the heat distribution very adequately. And similarly, not an issue of anyone that's around now, just cost-saving measures at the time, because they're having the same conversations that we are now um, in 1988 and 1964. Similar accessibility issues at exterior doors, really uh, just the way things were back then. We didn't have the rules we do now, but we have to account for them at this point. And uh, lighting upgrades as well just because uh, the, the new lighting with better controls, and I believe it's known that children uh, have a better educational experience for that. So there, here's some pictures. This, this is an original 1964 boiler to the facility. Um, this is also similarly an original 1964 air handler that we weren't able to uh, balance actually this year because the tags, we, we no longer have the information in order to do that. Um, <coughs> Interesting details at the exterior envelope where just some water catches and things like that that would need to be addressed. Um, th these are original 64 windows at the gymnasium, which are anticipated to be non-tempered. Non um, and They don't quite function correctly, so that's something on the list to definitely get get worked on. Similarly, these are 64 windows that open up into the uh, kind of the breezeway in traffic, so that was another item that Albert had flagged would be on the top of his list. And like I said, the lighting, the drops at the exterior doors. So similar, similar issues with the, with the uh, age of construction, but just how things were done at that time. Uh, the city school has had some uh, major renovation, originally built in 68, but have some major renovations through 2008, 2011. Has a very, uh, I don't want to sound, make this sound too negative. There is a lot of very good things going on here, and there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, at all the facilities. This, the, the SACS, uh, San Alvin City Schools, HVA system is quite advanced, um, and, and that's, that's performing very well. There is, uh, there is similar building envelope, uh, upgrades and repairs we, we've flagged. Uh, there's some fire, fire alarm devices, which would be top of the priority list. Um, there's some spaces that, as the facility's grown, it, uh, has needed more office space and just hasn't uh, had the chance to upgrade the HVAC equipment to serve those spaces. And uh, so there's operable partitions, and if you, I don't know who's been over there, there's operable partitions in that school that are uh, reported to be original to the facility, and that's a, a new situation needs to be accommodate that, because that's kind of an integral part of uh, their learning process. And the accessibility there is very unique in that, similarly, no, in an inherited condition, but the doors are very narrow, um, and it's that's a tricky one because they're solidly grounded in CMU walls, so not wildly impactful to the day-to-day -day operations until you have someone that has has a need that has to go through those doors. So that's that's a very unique condition. There's areas where obviously the air sealing. Um, that just things have moved over time and could, could improve occupant comfort and uh, efficiency if we could tune those up. Um, areas of the storefront, similarly, that's all all original built into the, the CMU block walls and the original windows that are just, over time, things move, especially in Vermont winters, so things that just need to be accounted for over time. Um, roof leaks, actually, uh, I was shown flagged down by the principal that day, and this was, it was raining, and so that was a good day to go get a look at that. Things that things like that that just needs to be planned for over time. Uh, this would be an example of the space is a premium, but uh, just had had a chance to to upgrade the ventilation and the airflow into these retrofitted offices here to accommodate uh, the increased need for staffing. And then the town education center, um, similarly. Had a major renovation, added some wings and floors, um, so that 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 has had seen some upgrades to the HVAC system since it was originally built in 1966. Uh, we're showing a little bit less of a, a fiscal need there. There are similar similar items that could be upgraded in the HVAC uh, package in terms of uh, the original B wing uh, is kind of an outdated technology, and I was probably the least touched in that renovation just because it was already existing. You know, the other additions were built around it. Um, <clears throat> there's an interesting one, everyone's probably seen the metal roofing. Uh, it's not, not something that you usually see with that prefinished metal roofing is, is delaminating. You can see it coming down the road and that really, uh, it, right at this point in time, after getting up there, it kind of 
the primer coat is looking good, so it's, it's really a matter of jumping on that as soon as possible to try to catch that while it's, the integrity of the, the roofing is still good. Uh, the, a big one there, which actually was an issue last year, and we we're looking at this one also with uh, Arlen Skangas, is the, the ice buildup on the roof creates some very uh, hazardous conditions as well. Uh, similarly, at the front steps, you know, concrete in Vermont just doesn't last. Uh, as well as we'd like, so we've got some trip hazards and then some finished details inside uh, that we'll take a look at. So this, this would be those trip hazards. We're talking about uh, the acoustic, acoustic panels in the gym space are kind of just a particle board that have gotten pretty beat up over years. These are some photos of where the ice buildup occurs on the metal roof and obviously it takes an impact on the brickwork. And uh, this is a, the sidewalk to the kitchen underneath this photo. Um, and that's probably a similar photo that you see. You see that coming down the uh, access ramp there. And, and just brick repairs that are kind of difficult to address. The B-Wing system is served by these old uh, unit ventilators and a few independent uh, mechanical systems, which creates a lot of points of uh, contact, a lot of points of failure that, that need to be maintained. And also take up a lot of space. So we've been talking with engineering services about a way to potentially uh, Eliminate a lot of the three of these units and a dozen of these unit ventilators, which obviously add floor space as well. Uh, and then there's the district office, which is kind of an in development situation, probably aware of with uh, Arnold and Skangas, and I just got a kind of a write up of that from last this afternoon. So, kind of a rundown on that. It was originally multi family housing, so clearly not purpose built for its use at this point in time. Multiple electric meters, um, really outdated and lack of a mechanical system. Not a lot of uh, insulation and air sealing, uh, pretty outdated finishes, not a lot of accessibility in terms of, you've all probably been down in the conference room, really needs an accessible bathroom built off it. So we've included that in the, uh, in the capital plan as well. So I, uh, that would be my last slide before questions, but also uh, Aaron's queued up if you want to take a look at that spreadsheet that we've been working on as well, facilities managers and uh, Martha and Bill have all taken a look at it. Uh, just like I said, kind of a living document at this point in Google Sheets for the, for the district to use. Moving forward, uh, we'll just take a quick look at it. That's the first presentation. So it's it's tool. If you just zoom out, to like seventy-five percent. Just run through, run through a little bit. Is that big enough? Or even a little bigger. Screen. So again, in here we, we can plot out and add and subtract. Oh. <laughs> so through here, every facility has its own section. We can plot out. Um, we can add and subtract projects as they come up and they become accomplished. Um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> Right now. Late. Uh, we can we can change the total cost. <laughs> John, I think you just lost it. It's okay. <clears throat> it's okay. I mean, we can. We got. This is, this is supplemental uh, to yeah. the presentation. So uh, we can obviously correct for inflation here. <laughs> we, we we can open it up to questions. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Um, You've done a nice job. It's, it's one we've looked at. Martha and I have looked at. That okay. It's it's one that's totable. Linked. We just put a three percent inflation factor on it across the it's, twenty years and, and the, done everything in two thousand twenty one dollars. It's sausage cost. making, so we don't necessarily need to dive into it one time. But I think there was going to be like a bottom line summation year by year. Yes. The down there. Yeah. Could, yeah. could we at least take a look at that quickly? You, you don't have to. You don't have to zoom. You can just scroll. Just scroll, scroll over. Uh, so, and like I said, it's really. This would be adjusted even as as we kind of go through things. And um, well, a big thing, and I don't want to steal Bill's thunder here, that I haven't touched on is, uh, you know, the ESSER funding work that we've also been running in parallel with this would kind of take some of these things off the table, obviously, and then. We would have to reshuffle everything uh, based on however we can allocate those those funds, which is we have actually a meeting about that next week as well. So you're gonna have to go down quite a ways, John. Yeah. <laughs> Play facility. Down. Oh, there you go. So you're looking down here, right? Yeah. So it's a little hard to see, but um. yeah, that's the <laughs> now idea. you can. That's the idea. Perfect. 
So the first few years are going to be re relatively accurate. And then after yeah, it, it, we're going to lose some accuracy as we go through. But as you saw in the report, um, there's about a total of about $26 million worth of work that needs to be done. I know, I know that shows 21 there. There's a couple of projects that aren't in there. And really comes to if you said, okay, every year we want to put in an equal amount, it's about $1.2 million. <coughs> I had Martha look at some figures in our budget real quick. Uh, currently, we have about approximately about $150,000 across the SU that goes towards capital projects that are done by year. Uh, Len could tell you some of those things, like when they do floors around here, like you saw some of the places we've moved to ceramic floors. Uh, or Derek at SATEC has put in laminate. They've also been trying the vinyl plank floors, which we've gotten better response. Um, so the things like that that we know we have a little bit in our budget. The other piece is we know that, um, and as you, I've reported in the past, we have about $13.1 million in ESSER funds. Construction is allowable uh, for certain projects. The biggest one, the easiest one to talk to is about is either life safety or HVAC. The Agency of Education Vermont is frowning on that, but if you're going to use ESSER funds, they want to see you combine that with other funding mechanisms. And as you know, right now we have a capital, uh, capital projects reserve fund that we use when we transfer any excess funds at the end of the year. The voters approve that for us to do that. And there's a currently audited in there, and we're just we just had the first part of the field audit for FY21. So I'm I'm back to FY20, right, Martha? Thank you. I heard you whisper it over there. <laughs> Martha will correct everything I get wrong here. Um, <laughs> we have about 4.5 million dollars in there. So what we'll come back with more of a spending plan. As Hunter's talked about, we're Hunter's helping us also with the federal applications with this, and, and we have to, there's a two-step approval, which I won't go into all that process, but um, we're hoping to use about $4 million from ESSER and $3 million from the capital fund to really leverage it, because one of the things we know is if we're going to take down a ceiling to do HVAC, don't put a new ceiling up with the old lights. Put in new lights. You know, you, you got to do some of that. So if you're going to take one of the, and SATAC is a, a great one when we talk about B-Wing, we can do that HVAC, but there's other things Derek's seen that in the next five years we got to do anyway. So if we're going to do it, put it together. So that's some of the thinking in this work. Um, what we have to refine that more and bring that back to you as a board. There are actually things that the state requires the board does and does mm -hmm. through motions, but also I want you to, you know, are we in the right place with what we're thinking about spending? Mm -hmm. Taking that that seven million dollars worth of work is in that spreadsheet. There's a couple things missing. One of the things, big things that's missing in there is central office. There's really two big areas for me as your superintendent thinking about COVID that I'm really concerned about. One is central office and two is old BFA high school. Gravity flow, HVAC does not provide a lot of air circulation and there is none except for the boardroom at central office. Um, so those are areas that are concerned of mine with going and what we've been doing with the COVID. Um, I, I think I'll just leave it at that. We take any questions. Again, I thank Hunter for all his organization and document work. It's been incredible. So in order to get this done, oh, sorry, we need like about $1.25 million a year in order to get this done. And right now we have about, I'm telling you, you have about $150,000 in your budget. Okay. But that's, so that's non-budgeted. And there will, I should have said, there will be other needs we'll bring to you as well. I want you to understand the facilities needs and then help us with priorities as we think about the other needs we have as well. And environment's one of the top 10 factors in student learning. Um, I just, I would like to propose or find a way for us to start putting this in from, I know it's it's out here right now yeah. and it's open to people to, you know, to be able to you know, keep on doing and look, but I'm wondering if we can maybe post, um, I don't know, in the newspaper or make sure that it's on, you know, the school websites and whatnot. Just this this list, you know, that this breakdown because it's great, but it's also important for people to start to, to see, to start to wrap their heads around as we start to make, you know, budgetary decisions. But I just think the more um, transparent we can be and get it out there into all the communities, I think that that would be really helpful. Is that typical that this kind of information would be that accessible? Not that detailed. There are facilities reports that go when usually when there's bond capital plans. 
And it doesn't mean it can't be. It just um, that's. It's going to be important to have community buy-in and yep. support um, and understanding. And I think we've gone ahead of ourselves sometimes and not gotten that community engagement. And one of our responsibilities as the board is to make sure that we're engaging the community as much as we can, as much as they want to be. So I think we've got to make an effort. I'd recommend pairing kind of with that information is, you know, even if it's just a short piece about how environment impact, impacts student mm -hmm. learning, so people have an understanding, you know, why we're doing this. Right. Yeah. And I guess the other thing that I would throw into that is that if we're already contemplating a new facility, well, shouldn't that also be, you know, put into this, or is that part of the other? We're not looking at a new facility. We're looking at renovations of what we have. Right, but we're talking about a potential new to us facility in terms of an alternative program. Oh, so I just want to make sure that whatever yeah, work that was that wasn't in this piece. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Though. But if it's so, if there's stuff that needs to get done in there in order to be brought up to you know whatever specs that needs to be brought up to that that would also be put into this plan. Yeah. So I think if we if we make a decision that we're going to post this spreadsheet. I think that I wouldn't suggest I wouldn't this suggest suggest this spread. spreadsheet because like I was saying, I mean, that was kind of an audible, I just decided on my own to send that to Aaron and I think I sent the wrong one because everything that was in the executive <laughs> summary was correct and obviously that bottom line wasn't. So that's a very living document I would just throw out there. I think the exact, something like the executive summary would yeah. maybe be. Yeah, whatever you determine. To, I just yeah. mean to put out, to, to, to begin to let people know this is the work that needs to be done in each of the yeah, facilities. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good, because I was going to advise against it or say that we have to put like a thousand disclaimers on it because yeah, it's, it's estimate, only it's as good as it, the yeah. minute. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. you don't so, really know what you're getting into. There's a kind of per window estimates, and, but we don't really necessarily know what's right. in there. Right. And that's but deep I, in the weeds, But I, I do appreciate say. what everyone's saying and that we maybe need to do something like an executive summary I, or something. I think there's a happy medium. Yeah. A happy Whoever medium that we can post yeah. that yeah. is a living, breathing document that, again, yep. we put draft on so that it is subject to change based on the needs and safety yeah. issues sure. that come up. I think, and I don't want to speak out of turn here, kind of the goal of, of this was to get a general overview of, of the, the big lump sum and the percentage of, of what's at, what is being done now and, and how that could be planned for in the future. So it's not to get on a case-by-case -case basis, but kind of a, a meta view right now. And then obviously it's, it's a priorities discussion with all the other competing factors of everything that you all have to go. So. Right, thank you. I have a quick question, right. or maybe yeah. just a comment. Um, is it fair to say that maybe we've been underspending on facilities? I mean, when I see 1.2 million going forward and I hear that we have something on the order of 150,000 budgeted, to me that says that maybe we've been underspending on facilities. Yeah. And we need to play a little bit of catch up, and then so, we need to set a new normal. Yeah. And that might be a message that needs to make it out there. So what 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 does it take to catch up if, if that's the 1.25 million over the next, I don't know, 20, uh, years. 20 years? And then, um, you know, thereafter, if we can get into a better uh, maintenance or preventative yeah. schedule that keeps their costs down, but it'll probably be more than 150,000 so a year. I, yeah, I would actually tell you that from my experience, people yeah. run facilities outside of BFA are in some of the best shape of any school buildings I've ever worked in. I think that's reflected and, in the numbers. And, and it's reflected in the numbers. I was actually, yeah. when Hunter first gave me the total, I was like, oh, that's not what I was thinking. I was thinking like double or three times that amount sure. um, for the amount of square feet we have. Mm -hmm. But the... I think about other districts in, in Vermont. We have a we have a capital buildings crisis right now. It's happening. There's they don't the reason the the legislature passed the bill they did H four twenty one. Am I right on that, Hunter? Something 26, like that. Twenty six. Something, something like that. that yeah. To do an assessment of all the buildings because they want to know how bad it is in Vermont because there are buildings in this state that you can't have kids in once the wind gets up to a certain speed. So. Um, I want to compliment how well our facility directors have done the work they've done over the years with this true stream budget. Mm -hmm. I also agree with you, Grant, saying, so what's a realistic expectation that we should have in the budget? 
if we added 1.2 million right now to on top of the 61 million budget we have, mm -hmm. we just made a 1.6 percent increase on the yep. budget. So these are why we're going to have hard discussions about priorities and how can we do something different and still keep as well, if not better, for the kids or have to ask the question, what aren't we doing? Mm -hmm. Because if we try to do everything, we'll have a hard time doing everything well. Yep. So. Well, on that happy note. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I have a question. Yeah, Is your background architecture or engineering? Uh, neither construction. Construction. Yeah. Okay. I mean, adjunct to that exposure wise, but thank you. I, I'm just trying builder, to think of the builder side. Of the I was just trying to predict what lens you're coming from. That's all. Oh. Thank you. No, that's fair. Any other questions uh, related to facilities? I have a question, I guess, for the board, um, and I don't know if we have an answer for it. Would we pre would we prefer a budget that's level loaded over 20 years? Something that's front end loaded, something that's back end loaded, something that's, you know, maybe, you know, maximizes spending five ish years down the road. Do we have do we have a sense for what we want? Dude, that's a really good question. Probably. Uh, maybe something to think about. Something to think about. And maybe something for you and Martha to. Yeah, we well. So Martha Hunter and I and Laz have been talking about that, and mm -hmm. that's why we want to leverage some of the ESSER funds along with our capital plan to see if we can cut down some of those costs. Okay. To get to do some front, upfront spending in the next three years, we have to have it spent by September two thousand twenty-four. Okay. Well, it's FY twenty-five, but it's twenty-four is when it's done, right? Something like that. So we'll that's why we have the discussion around the seven issues. I really. want you to see this first, and then I want to yeah. bring you a proposal of what we're starting to think about. Okay. Yeah. Great. Oh, like this is like one of several other fixes that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Fixes that need to happen too. Yeah. So. You were saying that um, the Department of Ed and was uh, frowning on the use of HVAC and what was the other one? I'm sorry. Oh well, it's life safety, but they're life frowning safety. of using ESSER funds for construction. It's coming all the way from the U.S. Department of Education. And so, although the legislature was intended to address these issues, which it is from the federal level, that you get into the program people at the U.S. Department of Education. And so they're frowned, they want to see more of it going to kit. They don't really want to see any ESSER money spent on construction. They want to see it all for direct supports to students. And this is a support for students, I would say. I mean, that, I would, that's where I go back. That's why I made the comment I did about learning. It's more sustainable for the school than doing new programs that you're not going to be able to fund later on. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah. who cares if they've grown on it? <laughs> Everything I read, they do have sections which, and it could have been changed since the last time I read it, they do identify things that are qualified in yeah. that regard. Um, they may back come off that at this point. But, so. Okay, well. Perfect. So we don't have to think about in this arena for sure. Thank you. Um, okay. Item eight. Other business warrants. Um, we need a motion to approve the warrants, acknowledging that passage of this motion will act as authorization and signature of any individual board members participating remotely. Please. Thanks, Nina. Is there a second? I'm going to be Thanks, Alicia. We're going to vote on the motion. Jack. Yes. We're voting on the motion to, for warrant. Yes? Yes. Al. Yes. <laughs> Nina. Yes. Susan. Yes. Joanna. Yes. Grant. Yes. Alicia. Yes. Peter. Yes. Nilda. Yes. Thank you all. Superintendent's report. Take it a week. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Nilda. I guess yeah. try to pass before I. I think there's only two of these coming around. Um, I want to talk to you about four pieces on the superintendent report. Okay. Update on behavioral issues in the schools. I talked about that last time. Uh, staffing levels and school closure. I need to start giving. I unfortunately have to talk to a little bit of that. Um, equity update. As I spoke about at the last meeting, I want to give an update to that. And then um, some direction that I've been giving, that we've been reinforcing, the leadership team and I have been reinforcing with our staff um, about how we're approaching this year. So I think I'll start with the behavioral issue. I just want to let you know, I talked to you about that we're seeing the uptake, you're seeing it in the news, it's happening in, in schools. Um, we can talk about many other ways that, that it's being encouraged. 
um, through social media, but I just want to let you know it is taking a, a, a toll on our staff, mm -hmm. and they are worn. Uh, I can say that for every member of the Maple Run staff. I see it daily in them. So if you see them, just give them a pat on the back. Say, we, we know you got, you're doing the best you can, and, and what can we do to help? And, and I, I, I said to one of my colleagues who's here tonight yesterday, she said, I just need you to listen. I know you can't solve it, just listen. I said, I can do that. So, um, we at some of our schools are, because of COVID quarantining and nope. illness, not necessarily COVID, are getting close to some staffing levels that may cause us to shut down school for a day or two. Um, I think Swanton went through it. I know Springfield School District went through it. Uh, there's some others in Vermont that I don't remember by name. We are, I can tell you we have some wizards that are sitting behind you right now in the way they juggle literally every morning. Um, and I'm saying the principals and the assistant principals. Uh, and I also know that there have been central, off we sent central office staff out into buildings. Um, we'll continue to do that to support. I was asked today by one of my colleagues, you know, when do we shut down? Because we had 17 people out of one of our buildings. And I said, what I heard from Springfield, from talking to that superintendent, they got to about 25%. Said, okay, we're down 25% of our staff. We can't run this building. I don't know what the exact number is for us. I hope we don't have to experience that. But I want you as a board to know that the people that are here from the leadership team are working their tails off to keep school open because we know it's good for kids and we want that to happen uh, but they're scrambling every minute of the day and they're really that being COVID folks and taking care of COVID and managing staff absences is a, and behavior is all they're doing and it's all they can do and I'm not going to ask them to do it anymore so I just I need to say that for them and thank them for their work because they're doing a great job so thank you all everything you do every day well, yeah. a good question and maybe is there anything we can do for the Sub. staff at MRS UID that are no that are just a thank you a cup of coffee uh, it brings in something I don't know just a thank you I know it's be small but is there anything we Sub. can do I'm not kidding Find subs find see if I there's somebody in the community who can do that because that's what they need more than anything well just also too just a yeah I don't know I'm just I think I, I think an appreciation to the staff uh, something something yeah they've been working hard and, uh, and everybody has and, and I think just, it's something, is there something we could, can do it's just I think hard. one the board just recognizing the hard work the staff does and you could do that okay. through a resolution or a, a motion and I think also saying that when you see them we know you guys are working your tail off okay. they really are I'm proud to be one of your colleagues uh, the last thing, and it goes in line with all of this, is um, a message I've been trying to give um, at faculty meetings, is that this is not, we are not back to normal. And a lot of people are having a sense of loss because we're dealing with the change. And so you see that come out in other, we see that coming out in our students, but we see that coming out in ourselves, myself included, um, in either anxiety or anger or frustration or sadness. Um, and one of the things I've been encouraging, I don't have a lot of answers for them for how to do it, but to, we have to make some hard priority decisions and really work on Maslow's hierarchy. And we need to make sure everyone's physically and mentally taken care of, and then socially and emotionally. And that if we can't do that, we can't get to academics. So I have tried to say that. People were, are feeling a loss of that because they thought they were coming back to get into the academic portion but we just can't do that uh, and that's another piece where you can give support Nina is like we understand let's get the let's get us all let's get us back to adjusted and working well together first then we can work on the academics because we don't do that we're not going to get to the academics. yeah no I understand I just no no I'm just saying I didn't mean to direct no, 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 it towards no, you no I just I just that, that's, that's been my message something that, I don't know that's my just... message to the staff is is really you know, give yourselves a break and give the kids a break on the academics. Let's work on that piece. So, Thank you. That's my report. Anything else? No. Okay, we're up to the board announcement section. Any board member have any announcements to make? 
No sporting updates, Susan? Well, I'm going to say some of the Fairfield and Bakersfield runners are doing amazing work. Yay. Thank you. Pretty amazing. <coughs> Thank you. All right, agenda for future meetings. We have the IT study. We have a, a final report for the closing of the five-year plan. When can we expect that final report for the closing of the five-year plan? I'll have to talk with my colleagues about that. Okay. That may take a little bit from where we've been. All right. And I did forget one thing in my report that I thought was important to Okay, add. well, we'll let you go back and get it. <laughs> Sorry, but I really, I want to get this because I talked to you about it last time and I don't know why I skipped over. I said I was going to give you an ec equity She's update tired. on the work and then I didn't say anything to it. Okay. So um, at the last meeting I said we were going to bring together our community to start to talk um, about what's happened in our district and our desire for racial harm to stop occurring. Um, we're working with our restorative consultants to plan a communication a communication conversation, and their first step is to convene a design team that is racially and ethically diverse and has a deep knowledge of our community. This team is largely in place and ready to start working to design the work. This team will be thinking about design decisions together, such as what language we will be most welcoming, where the event will be located, and how to outreach can be most effective and more. Having a real conversation as a community about harm that has occurred and continues to occur here and how we can take real steps for it to stop occurring is critical work. It's too important and too complicated to rush into if we hope to make a lasting and meaningful change. If we were quick or easy to figure out how to stop racial and other harm from occurring, someone would have figured it out by now. While moving slowly and carefully can feel like we're not taking this issue seriously, I guarantee you we are taking this very seriously and we want the process to have a real chance for something real and lasting to come out of it if it happens thoughtfully and more slowly. As you may know, white supremacy culture is how we as white people are used to operating in ways we are often unaware of how it feels normal. Urgency is one aspect of white supremacy culture and it can cause us to take actions too quickly that create more harm. That's the last thing I want to do or we want to do as a team. This is too important to rush and do it poorly. Our consultants and I have agreed on this and they are putting the design team should meet this week to start the process. I was hoping I could bring you a date tonight for this conversation, but they said, Bill, this is way too important to do it rushed and wrong. And I really thank them for their guidance in that. And I hope sh soon I will be letting you know the work of that design team and putting it together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, we did talk about looking at governance, mm -hmm. and we did have three. We had three people, and I just need to meet with Nina and Jack and Grant on yeah. governance to say, just to find a meeting date. That's all I want to do tonight is quickly grab you and get a calendar and look for a date. Um, I wanted to just ask the um, see if the district was uh, participating in the youth risk behavior survey this year. I would assume we are. I haven't. Yes. I get the nod from the back of the person that's on that. Yeah. Awesome. I got the letter from my kids. So Great. <laughs> I would hope I didn't we didn't think I had yet. That's why I was asking. All right. Thank you. So I think we covered everything. We get no other board announcements. Um, we got the agenda for future meetings. Okay, so we had a finding earlier that we could go into executive session related to negotiation prep because public premature public knowledge would place us at a substantial disadvantage. We also need to go to executive session to discuss a personnel issue, and that's standard for any personnel issue to be in executive session. I suppose we can say it's a finding because it's a personnel issue. So we need Bill and Martha for the for negotiation both. section session and, and both. We need Martha for both. Both. So anyway, that's that. So uh, I need a motion to go into executive session for the two items I just mentioned. So, Is there a second? Oh. Okay. All in favor? Jack. Yes. Al. Yes. Nina. Yes. Susan. Yes. Joanna. Yes. Grant. Yes. Alicia. Yes. Peter. Yes. Uh, and Nilda, yes. Okay, so we're going to be in executive session. Let's take about a five or so minute break while.